So hello, everyone. I am Terry Swartz Russell, the Director of Family and Adult Education at Temple Emanuel. And I'm thrilled to welcome you to tonight's presentation. Um, I just want to introduce Phil Goff, who's our speaker tonight. Uh, he's a city planner specializing in transportation modes and networks. He's going to lead us in a lively visual presentation that explores public policies, real estate factors, and demographic shifts throughout the mid 20th century that um, you know showed how Boston's thriving community and how it moved and uh, what moved to the suburbs and beyond and what happened. Um, following that, we'll have a Q and A um, and you can share a little bit if you have a, a Boston story. And um, we'll also, I'm gonna ask everybody to remain um, you know, muted, but if you have something to say, you can say it in the chat. If you have a question, you can put it in the chat. And uh, the other thing is we are recording tonight's session. So if you don't want to be seen, you can always, um, you know, uh, stop your video. And uh, I'm going to introduce Phil with his presentation tonight is tracking the roots of the Jewish diaspora in Boston. Take it away, Phil. Great. Thanks so much, Terry. And um, thanks for setting this up, of course. Thanks to the whole Temple Emmanuel community and, and membership for um, just having an adult education program, which of course is really important. And, um, you know, giving me the opportunity uh, to make this presentation. Um, so I'm just gonna, just gonna jump right in after Terry's great uh, introduction of, uh, of me. And, um, you know, what you're looking at here is the is Congregation Adaf Jeshrun, which as you can see from the label there was better known as the Blue Hill Avenue Shoal. And as we were speaking before, when we were chatting five or 10 minutes ago, you know, many of the synagogues back in old Boston and cities probably really throughout the US, um, a lot of the congregations wanted to really mark their territory. And, you know, they picked up names that were really based as much on the street as anything else. Anyhow, Blue Hill Avenue, of course, uh, you know, if you were the one shul like this was to be the Blue Hill Ave shul, Blue Hill Ave, for those that uh, aren't aware, and I know many of you are, and some of you grew up in the area or your parents grew up in the area. Or for those that don't know, where this is gonna be all kind of brand new, Blue Hill Avenue from Grove Hall in the Roxbury area to Mattapan Square was really the, the central spine uh, of a neighborhood in Boston that was home to 75 to 85,000 Jews in the mid 20th century. There's a lot of different numbers out there, but those are the ones that I think um, seem to explain the sort of the scale of the community there, 75,000, 80,000, 85,000. So, you know, I, I've lived in the area for, uh, I lived in the area 15, 16 years, and I didn't even really realize um, that such like a, a significant and large and dense community um, uh, was in, in existence uh, in Boston. Um, and I think it's important for people to really understand uh, some of this history and sort of understand what is still left in the neighborhood. So. Uh, in terms of the, the physical infrastructure. So we're gonna talk about the socio and economic factors um, that both you know, pulled Jews out to the suburbs like Newton that many of you, if not all of you live in, uh, but also the public policies and the um, uh, uh, urban renewal projects and other things that and ethnic tensions that really pushed them out as well. So I just wanna acknowledge that uh, I'm not a historian, I'm an urban planner as, um, Terry had mentioned, and as you saw in the, in the promo for this, after reading the book, The Death of a American Jewish Community, which I, I highly recommend for those that haven't seen it last year, I did some more research uh, and I really wanted to offer this presentation again, build that awareness and recognize the history that's, that's still there. So what, what also you'll note in my presentation is that you're gonna learn a lot or probably learn a lot about Boston Black community as well, because its history is really fully intertwined with um, uh, the Jewish community's history in Boston as well. So buckle up, there's a lot of info here. I'm gonna throw at you a lot of slides. This is probably pretty much like a solid hour, um, but I'm gonna get through it and uh, then we'll have a, a good discussion afterwards. So anyone that might do a, a, a Google search, a Google map search for Boston area synagogues, uh, will come up with you know, what you'll see is something that looks similar to this. And I think as we all know, there's that sort of um, that concentration in the Coolidge Corner area 
through Brookline and then that kind of access through uh, parts of Newton is where you, you see you know, such a concentration, the highest concentration of synagogues in the area now in, in 2021. And obviously there are others that are uh, sprinkled around. And what stands out of course is, is the void. Um, you know, such a large part of Boston, Roxbury, Dorchester, Mattapan, where you know, right now there, there are no synagogues, uh, zero at all. Um, and we know that you know, 50, 50 to 80 years ago, this was the largest concentration of Jews really anywhere in North America outside, of course, uh, of New York City. And unlike, unlike New York and other cities, Montreal, Baltimore even, a few other cities where there are some you know, vestiges of the old Jewish neighborhoods in those cities. Sometimes they're you know, bakeries or old synagogues, community centers, Jewish museums, et cetera. You know, here in Boston in that old neighborhood, except for the uh, old buildings that are now churches, there's really pretty much nothing. So what I wanna explore here and the focus of this presentation is, is what happened. Uh, and to talk about those demographic factors, the socioeconomic factors, again, that, that uh, kind of pulled people out to the suburbs and then the stuff that was going on from a policy point of view, projects and ethnic tensions and other social issues that kind of push them out um, uh, out of the neighborhood and out, out to the suburbs. So before I get there, really, I wanna just set a, a historic context of you know, how such a large community, 75 to 80,000, 85,000 Jews did end up in uh, Roxbury, Dorchester um, and Mattapan. And I'm gonna you know, start back uh, in 1890s and at the end of the 19th century, uh, the immigration um, that occurred, immigration to uh, Boston, it, it trailed uh, many other cities uh, in the US, certainly trailed Philadelphia and uh, New York and even other mid-sized cities you don't think about with large Jewish populations like you know, Louisville, uh, Kentucky, for instance. A big part of that was the concern that immigrants have that Boston was so completely dominated in the mid and late 19th century by the Yankee Protestants. So there was some concern that there wasn't necessarily the, the welcoming nature in Boston. Um, as you got to other places. Despite that, you know, certainly there were uh, many mostly Central European Jews that did end up locating uh, in Boston, German and Polish for the most part, uh, where they settled um, you know, prior to or between the end of World, uh, um, World War I, the Civil War, sorry, and 1890 was um, what, what we now consider really the theater district. It was called then the Lower South End. Theater District is where uh, originally the first um, community groups um, settled, and then they gradually moved further uptown or to the south into the new, um, you know, row house neighborhoods, brick row house neighborhoods that were built by the by the thousands uh, in the 1880s and 1890s. And you know, the the kind of anchor of that part of the community back then was Temple Israel, built in 1885. And the interesting thing about this building, it's still there. That is a an image from a Google map, uh, you can go down and see it, is because the skyline in Boston at the time was so dominated by church steeples, the, the architects did the, uh, made the unusual decision of actually putting uh, steeples in the two towers at the synagogue, which you wouldn't see in, in most of the synagogues in Europe. Um, soon after, as uh, more and more settlement um, came into uh, the Boston area in the 1890s and into the 1900s. Uh, most of the uh, immigrant Jews were settling next to the uh, other immigrant groups, mostly Catholic groups from uh, Italy, from, from Ireland, from Poland, uh, from Greece uh, and elsewhere. And at the time, uh, by 1900, you had about 15,000 Jews in, uh, settled in Boston and about 3,000 in Chelsea, obviously uh, a lot happening there. Um, and they were settling in both the West End and um, uh, in the North End, the kind of uh, the, the anchor and the main retail street of the North End is Salem Street, which you see that photo, it's a pretty well-known photo. Maybe you've, uh, you've seen that before, and that is a, a cover of the, of the book, the Boston, uh, the Boston Jews. At the time in the, uh, the Jews of Boston, I'm sorry. At the time in the West End for over a hundred years was actually the, um, uh, the black community of Boston lived as well. Um, they were concentrated mostly in what we consider the North Slope of Beacon Hill, but back then was 
was part of the West End. And as Jew, the Jewish population and other immigrant groups started to expand, um, the African-Americans moved more into the South End and three of the, uh, the, old, uh, the old black churches in the uh, West End became synagogues, including uh, for a time period, the Vilna Shul, while they, before they built the uh, structure that uh, you probably know now and perhaps have visited downtown the Vilna Shul, but they were, prior to that, they were in a, a Baptist church um, before that. So things kind of went full circle. Jews kind of um, sort of displaced many of the Blacks in the West End, uh, Blacks moved into the South End, and as Jews started moving from there, uh, Blacks took over three of the synagogues, actually, and those became churches as well. So I typed it, it it's not an easy thing, but I, I tried in this presentation to diagram the, the movement of the diaspora, so to speak, in different time periods. Um, wasn't an easy thing, but I, I try to show here, um, you know, as in the next a couple of decades, um, as you know, more and more of the Jewish families attain middle-class status, uh, they wanted to have, like, like many, of course, wanted to have more space, uh, larger homes, et cetera. And they started you know, leaving from the North End and from the West End and from Chelsea, uh, moving into places what were considered uh, back then, the suburbs of Roxbury uh, and Brookline uh, and Brighton. Um, the, the working class folks either uh, stayed where they were or, you know, followed the uh, in, in industrial movement. So there was, you know, lots of uh, jobs in the leather industry and the shoe industry up in Lynn and Somerville and East Boston. So uh, there was kind of movement within that period of uh, working class closer to the old North uh, and West End neighborhoods where the middle class were starting to uh, move out into the suburbs. By 1920, so whereas there was you know, 20 or 25,000 total um, back in 1900, um, by 1920, um, the numbers had increased to uh, 120,000 Jews. You can see um, you know, roughly how they're distributed, 25,000 in North and uh, West Ends. And you start to see that you know, more and more we're starting to move into the South End, uh, Roxbury and Dorchester. Uh, Chelsea's uh, population in 1920 was 15,000 Jews. It was later, about 10 years later in 1930, when it hit a peak at uh, 24,000, which was you know, more than half the population there. And given the size of the city, uh, the population density of Jews there was uh, really as high as anywhere, uh, again, outside of uh, New York City. Um, by 1920, really, you have the first, you see Brookline and Brighton, only 3,000. It was really, you know, it was that period, 1915, 1920, that uh, first Jewish families were starting uh, to move out. The middle class uh, started to settle in Brookline, and the, soon after, the first, you know, large-scale conservative uh, congregations were built, like uh, uh, Kahilath uh, Israel, there's Ohabe Shalom, which you're probably familiar with, that beautiful domed building as well. And th these were some of the first, uh, what were called synagogue centers anywhere in the United States. Um, prior to the 20s, synagogues were just built really as places of worship, maybe a few offices, a few classrooms, but the new synagogue centers in the 20s built in these suburban areas and became more and more popular. And co conservative and uh, reform uh, synagogues really had much larger uh, social halls and banquet facilities, classrooms, preschools, athletic facilities. So it's interesting thing about Brookline's history is two of the first synagogue centers really in all of the United States. Uh, started there. So uh, besides, besides Brookline, of course, in the next couple of decades, there was the acceleration and, and movement of more and more of the uh, working and middle class Jews from inner Boston um, out to other neighborhoods, the construction of new uh, subway and streetcar lines, and the, you know, the new uh, neighborhoods full of thousands of um, uh, triple deckers and two family homes that were built uh, became a strong pull. And you know, in those decades, you had the you know, tens of thousands of, um, of people moving out to a point where in 1950, we kind of reached that, that number of uh, 75, 85,000 Jews. So just uh, for a sense of a scale, uh, Newton's population is about at the high end there in the, the high 80s. So imagine really if 100% of the population of Newton were Jewish, all in a neighborhood about, you know, perhaps a tenth 
the size of uh, the city of Newton kind of gives you a sense of the, of the scale uh, of the people um, who would live there. Um, you know, most of those working class Jews that had moved to the area, um, which I'm gonna call for now on, so I don't get uh, a tongue twister here, I'll call it RDM um, uh, for the time period. So if you think about the, the high level, uh, the number of uh, Jewish population that were living in RDM at the time, um, you, you can't do this, but I wanted to recreate if someone had an opportunity to do a, a Google map in 1950 uh, and said Boston synagogues, um, you know, this is roughly what you would get based on the research uh, that I did um, in terms of uh, synagogue locations and what had been uh, opened um, and established by 1950. So you, know, you see that there's still in 1950, there's still a cluster in the West End, a couple in the South End, Chelsea still had a number and you, know, you saw the, the clustering that was occurring uh, immediately after World War II, especially um, in Brighton and in uh, Brookline. And of course, Temple Emanuel was uh, started with only one other show at the time in Newton, but uh, Emanuel started uh, 1935, uh, I believe. You can see that there, but you know, clearly the, the majority of the synagogues in the Boston area were in the RDM. So if, you, if one were to uh, zoom in uh, a bit more, you'll see that there are you know, no less than, than 28 synagogues, 28 shuls. Um, and this doesn't include the uh, many uh, shtibos in the area, which were kind of small and formal congregations, mostly uh, Orthodox folks that would uh, meet uh, mostly in, in homes. So there's probably dozens more of those as well, but uh, the 28 shtibos, uh, they were mostly, I mean, the 28 shuls, sorry, um, mostly clustered along Blue Hill Avenue, which you can see uh, running north to south, you see uh, uh, Franklin Park there. Uh, and I tried to highlight, I didn't get them all, of course, but there are kind of key nodes and institutions in the area, many of uh, which were kind of aligned along uh, Blue Hill Avenue as well. So if you zoom in just a little bit closer, even really kind of the, the heart, one could say, right at the kind of Dorchester and Metapan um, border um, was. Uh, uh, Woodrow Avenue. But just to give you a little better sense too of just kind of the, the density and the concentration of Jews who were in the neighborhood at the time. I mean, there was enough there that just along this, you know, three block stretch, three short block stretch of Woodrow Avenue, there were you know, six synagogues. Uh, again, this doesn't include the Stiebels. There's probably a handful more there. Um, and, and of course the G&G &G Deli was located uh, in this area as well. And at least three of those uh, synagogues are, are still there that you can, you can visit. And I'm gonna kind of talk more about what's out there a little bit later, but uh, Agudas Israel, Anchi Safar, 1921, right across the street, Hadath Israel. And then uh, just you know, to the side, you can see my mouse just across the other street was a uh, Hevra Shas uh, built in 1929 as well. Blue Hill Avenue, um, uh, Adjacent, of course, was where, um, you know, one could say with the heart of the community, uh, where, you know, many, many Jewish-owned businesses, um, theaters, markets, uh, grocery stores, uh, pharmacies, shoe stores, clothing stores, everything you can imagine. Um, it's sort of a full-service uh, street for the people that live nearby. There was a whole lot of pharmacies. It's kind of a legacy of the Prohibition era when um, you could go into a, a pharmacy and, and say the right word and get a drink. Um, that was the reality on Blue Hill Ave and, and probably lots of other places. Um, but because of the pharmacies and that legacy there and just the nature of the community, there are very few bars, unlike you know, many other of the working class neighborhoods in Boston, there are very few bars on Blue Hill Avenue. Uh, and it was considered you know, a very safe avenue, uh, very safe commercial district. People apparently you know, who lived nearby weren't locking their doors. I know it's kind of a cliche at this point. Uh, and you know, one of the anchors there was the G&G &G Deli. Uh, a place not just to eat and to schmooze with people, but that became really the go-to place for um, politicians, not just uh, those running for local office, but uh, running for a national office uh, as well, that they saw that as a place um, to really go and to campaign, Blue Hill Ave itself, and then at the g, &G Delhi, um, even uh, offices as high up as the president. So we had 
Uh, Eisenhower had a motorcade down Blue Hill Avenue. Um, uh, FDR in the 40s uh, visited the G&G Deli. They set up a, uh, a small wooden stage in front during campaign season because so many of the politicians came down. And there was the sort of election eve rally for none other than John F. Kennedy before the 1960 election uh, was at the G&G Deli as well. So the, the history there is really quite fascinating. I'm sure some of you, some of you uh, perhaps have even eaten there. Um, another focal point of the area was the Franklin Park Theater on Blue Hill Ave. Um, this was the kind of primary, um, primary gateway in many ways to Franklin Park, which was um, you know, the heart and lungs of the old RDM community. What really kind of dominated the uh, streetscape at the time or prior to, um, prior to 1941 uh, was the streetcar line in its own reservation. Um, so streetcars went up and down. Um, it really sort of, you know, had a real impact to have that open space, the double rows of trees in 1941, for better, for worse, I might argue for worse. Uh, the city ended up widening the roadway, taking out the trolley reservation. Uh, they became trackless trolleys uh, in the center of the roadway. Obviously, were slowed down and, and um, you know, there was that loss of the sense of public space. Um, the wall adjacent that you see in the bottom left, adjacent to Franklin Park, that was still not Franklin Park there, but Franklin Field, a block away, was still sort of a major gathering place for the community. But I'd argue that the you know the, the public space of Blue Hill Avenue really kind of shifted uh, quite dramatically when uh, the city widened the roadway. And then, kind of completing the tour to the south end is uh, Mattapan Square which is really kind of the largest concentration of businesses and some of the largest businesses and grocery stores uh, were down there as well. And, you know, it's relatively unchanged, I would say, perhaps today in terms of the buildings, obviously the trolley tracks and the overhead catenary wires are gone, but a lot of the buildings um, are still there. Uh, the side streets uh, of Blue Hill Ave, of course, is where the tens of thousands uh, of folks, primarily Jews, uh, lived in the area. Um, you know, many of the uh, working class folks who are up in the upper Roxbury area were in you know, three or sometimes four story apartment buildings. Um, the middle class or upper middle class did live in some single family homes, two family homes in the Washington Park area closer to Franklin Park. And then as you move south, it really became you know, triple decker land, two family land. There was you know, many streets uh, with either mix like you see uh, this image here or you know, all three families. All family homes and you know many of those had multiple generations living uh, in those homes in those triple deckers a lot of those units had two three four five kids uh, and there were there could be hundreds of hundreds of children um, living on some of these blocks and I'm sure that I had trouble finding some good images of just lots of kids playing out in the street stickball or whatever this is the best I could come up with but uh, I'm sure they just kind of throng the street. So I hope uh, to some degree that kind of quickly sets the stage and the, the context uh, for you know, how the Jewish community grew in the 1950. And for the second half of the presentation, I really want to explore the local and national factors that both you know, pulled Jews out and, and pushed them away from the city um, with this outline. Um, I also want to just briefly reference the principal sources that I've used uh, for this presentation that um, you'll soon see the rest of, of course. I already mentioned the book that I read. Um, I recommend all these, but especially if you can find The Death of an American Jewish Community is really just a terrific book. One of my favorites as an urban planner. That's a fascinating history. It's a bit sad and depressing for sure, but it's a fascinating history. The Jews of Boston, maybe some of you have seen that. It's sort of the seminal work on the and the history of the Jewish community um, back from the mid 19th century to um, you know, 2015, I think when it was recently published, Building a New Boston was a great one as well. And if you're interested in learning a bit more on what I just presented over the last uh, 20 minutes or so, if you go to YouTube and do a search for Sidewalk Memories Mattapan, there's a, it's a great video. I think it's about 75 or uh, 80 minutes long um, where it's you know primarily uh, interviews uh, a dozen or so uh, residents who grew up there and their, their memories of the old neighborhood. There's a few old videos here and there as well, and, and it's just great. So I recommend all these. 
um, starting with the book or starting the quickest thing you could do is tonight or tomorrow. You could watch that Sidewalk Memories uh, video on it. And I think you'll, many of you will, will find it very interesting. So um, going back to, you know, a little bit more of a lead up, uh, sort of the parallel lead up to the 1950s and is really to talk about the socioeconomic factors and kind of national policies that were happening in, in those decade periods. So really in the, starting in the 20s, uh, new neighborhoods throughout Boston and elsewhere were serviced by streetcar lines, but also wider roads. And these began uh, to draw middle-class white Americans out to the suburbs. This continued in the 30s and 40s, of course, and really accelerated after World War II. And I'd say arguably the desire to move out of congested cities to greener pastures is in some ways is an innate human desire. But the growth in the late 40s and the 50s in particular was really, you know, promulgated by the federal subsidies for uh, suburban housing and for highways. And the cheap housing and the free roads created a distorted market, which you know, clearly affected the choices of millions of Americans and altered the, the spatial growth of cities throughout the US for really a couple of decades. And while the federal government you know, guaranteed the home mortgages for the white middle class and paid for 90% uh, was the federal share of the cost of highways, very little was made available to inner city renters or those who wanted to purchase a, a home in the inner city. Uh, and virtually no federal investment in all those decades in public transit was made really until the 1970s. So in consequence, the urban neighborhoods, business districts uh, connected with them really suffered as the, as the new suburbs drew much of the capital and especially middle-class, primarily white um, families returning GIs um, out to the suburban areas. And it was in the 1930s, uh, the, the foundation in the 1930s and, and beyond of that suburban growth was the, were the various loan programs that were initiated by the Federal Housing Authority or the, the FHA. Um, they, the FHA created what's called the Home Owners Loan Corporation or the HOLC. And they provided federally guaranteed mortgages with fixed low uh, interest rates with the goal to stabilize the depression era housing market. That's all, sounds all well and good, uh, but the, the loans were really exclusively dependent on location. And for all, for all intents and purposes, these were available only to white applicants only. And the Hulk, the Hulk designated, as you see in these maps, uh, neighborhoods and cities throughout the country and graded them uh, A through D based on criteria, uh, criteria that was heav heavily weighted towards race and ethnicity. The better the grade, the better the terms on the long-term mortgages. So the grades were represented on a series of maps. And here's one of the maps from uh, inner Boston area uh, from 1938, the Cram Street maps. And neighborhoods, even with a modest pop black population were automatically a D or considered, you can see the labels there bottom left, considered hazardous. Uh, areas that had some percentage of uh, immigrants were graded a C or called definitely declining. Middle-class white areas were B, still desirable. And then the wealthy areas were graded A. And those A grades weren't just sort of the wealthier white areas, but they, it was required that those neighborhoods have homes um, that had racial covenants on the properties to ensure that they remained white in perpetuity. And if not, then it, was, it didn't get the A grade. So this, this policy really put into place the federal agency, uh, federal agency that institutionalized uh, the practice of using covenants and really kind of created the de facto uh, Jim Crow segregation in the suburbs, really, you know, throughout the U.S., not just in the South. So not only were these red areas, and the red areas, uh, some of you perhaps maybe guess now, that was the origin of the term redlining. Um, these areas were just, on a, there was no opportunity for mortgages or business investment loans, um, and they informally indicated areas where public funds were not invested for parks uh, and other improvements, and kind of gave the green light for the unwanted land uses like dumps, chemical plants, the large scale segregated uh, housing projects and highways is really the predicate for what we think of now as um, environmental racism is kind of one of the, one of the terms. So if, if you zoom in a bit on that 1938 CRAMS map and you look at the, uh, the RDM and what's highlighted here is really a good chunk of the RDM, at least Roxbury and uh, most of uh, Dorchester, and th this was graded a, uh, this was given a grade of C, 
Uh, and the reason was because it was, you know, primarily working class uh, immigrant Jews. And you could see, and you look at the kind of language used uh, in, the, in uh, areas, uh, section E, that was uh, infiltration of Jewish. So this was a, um, a place in E that you can look at all these maps, uh, especially in the red or the yellow areas, you'll, you'll see uh, which were the ethnic groups for all intents and purposes or racial groups that were you know, quote unquote infiltrating the neighborhoods. And there was, uh, there were uh, many other racist terms uh, and very prejudiced terms that were used that uh, frequently the terms undesirable were used on inharmonious groups, uh, lower grade groups uh, and groups, uh, especially when the term Negro was used, um, the kind of phrase threatening to spread uh, was frequently used as well. So this policy uh, really ensured that, you know, many generations of black families, not just in Boston, but throughout the US really did not have the ability, even if they wanted to, to kind of leave those neighborhoods that were, that were in essence red lines. Um, and they were denied the ability to not only invest in their own homes because the bank didn't want to have anything to do with uh, providing a loan um, and no federally backed uh, uh, mortgages or other loan guarantees were even given uh, to any of the homes or any business investments made in the, the C or the D neighborhoods. So that's sort of a, a big legacy that kind of comes up a lot even later on, but I thought it was important to really kind of explain what the, the Hulk policies were um, and how it's kind of redlining, which I'm sure is a term just about everyone knows, uh, but perhaps didn't know some of, uh, some of the details. So moving a little bit forward, um, uh, other policies uh, more locally, um, when uh, highways and urban renewal projects were being planned, uh, that certainly had its impact on a lot of uh, neighborhoods, uh, inner city neighborhoods, ethnic neighborhoods, and in the chase in the uh, case of Chelsea, uh, the planning for um, uh, the elevated uh, Route One Expressway and connecting to the Tobin Bridge at the time it was the uh, Mystic River Bridge, but the Tobin Bridge really kind of ran right through the the heart of the Jewish community uh, in Chelsea. Um, you can see that the, the three. Uh, of the historic synagogues were to the north of the alignment, the downtown Chelsea, and of course, lots of residential, uh, dense residential neighborhoods were there, and downtown Chelsea and some other institutions, another synagogue, were on the other side. And the, you know, the, the noise, the disruption, uh, the traffic, the pollution really helped to uh, disperse much of um, Chelsea's uh, Jewish population, which had peaked in the 30s, but still was about 20,000 in 1940. And within 10 years with the construction of the elevated expressway and other factors um, was reduced to 8,000 in 1950. 1950, of course, famously was, um, you know, when the urban renewal period really began um, in earnest in, in Boston and the, and the West End is certainly the, uh, the primary example. The Boston Redevelopment Authority, the BRA um, was formed and their, their goal was really to to clear uh, what they considered the blighted districts uh, near downtown and in the West End, as described a little bit before, there was still, uh, by 1950, there was still 10,000 Jews there and 10,000 other uh, immigrant groups, Italian, Greek, uh, Polish, uh, who lived in the area. It was definitely a neighborhood that was a bit rough on the edges, uh, but they considered it a very, certainly people that lived there, a very intact community. Um, city services began to dry up as the area got its urban renewal boundary and uh, it became a fata complete. Uh, and the blighted area that the BRA sort of said that neighborhood was ultimately did within a few years become the blighted area because it lost so many of the city services and um, uh, so little investment came into the, into the neighborhood. So as many of you are probably familiar with the story, you know, for all intents and purposes, three quarters of the neighborhood was just completely wiped out. Uh, 46 acres of probably the most dense uh, residential urban fabric really in all of New England was just uh, taken out. Uh, 20,000 people uh, in essence uh, lost their homes and this uh, really uh, precipitated obviously the um, uh, movement and exodus of uh, Jews away from uh, the West End into the, um, into the many neighborhoods that I kind of described a little bit 
uh, earlier uh, when I showed the, showed the map diagrams. So continuing on that theme of the urban renewal projects in the 1950s, which were really just kind of a, a big part of Mayor Collins at the time and the BRA's uh, program was to look at clearing out what was considered the blighted areas uh, close to downtown. Um, and a couple of the projects, whereas the, whereas the Chelsea, uh, the highway running through Chelsea and, the, and certainly the West End, that really impacted the Jewish, Jewish community most directly. The urban renewal projects in the 1950s and, and 60s in many ways really impacted Boston's black community. And that then by extension indirectly had a significant impact, which I'll get into in the Jewish community. So the Prudential Center project, the New York St Streets project and the I-95 uh, corridor clearance, which occurred, you know, very much was about clearing out areas uh, and led to, um, you know, dramatic increases in the property values of the South End. Um, that led to uh, a whole lot of uh, displacement and gentrification of, uh, of the area, which was really the core of Boston's black community that really had no opportunity to go anywhere else. Now, as those, uh, as prices went up uh, and displacement occurred, the black community was hemmed in really on three sides, you know, moving north, uh, shifting, uh, relocating north, you know, that was really more commercial district, of course. Immediately to the west was uh, Northeastern University, a Longwood area. Uh, to, the, to the southwest was really a stable uh, Jamaica Plain, stable kind of white middle class neighborhood. A lot of civil ser servants lived in the area. To the east was, was Southie and the, uh, the, the Irish Catholic parts of Dorchester, which um, you know, blacks who had attempted to move those areas really were just met with hostility and at, at times violence. So really the, the sort of soft neighborhood uh, was really to the South um, where, where of course um, Jews uh, had been living at this point for a number, of, a number of decades. This all coincided as the black community was feeling kind of squeezed uh, on many sides from the urban renewal projects and, and was uh, you know, putting a limit on the amount of you know, housing units that was available. Uh, this coincided um, with uh, this coincided with the um, uh, expansion of the black community through uh, immigration, the immigrants from the West Indies and from Cape Verde, and really just the ongoing uh, domestic migration from the South that continued into uh, the cities in the North uh, throughout the post-war period. Um, so, with that combination. The, um, you know, the housing stock was becoming more decrepit. The uh, population was uh, increasing and there were fewer and fewer units. And really the place to go, of course, was the South, uh, to the South, not to the South the United States, but to the South, into Upper Roxbury and parts of Dorchester. So sort of final, um, the final big urban renewal project was the Washington uh, Park project where you know, 2,500 units of lower income housing were demolished and replaced by 800 units of townhouses, which are really unaffordable to all the folks um, that had lived there. So, you know, moving into Upper Roxbury was the natural thing to do. And if there was any place in Boston where there was a pretty well integrated neighborhood, black and white, um, it was Upper Roxbury. There were many middle-class Jews, working-class Jews, but a lot of middle-class Blacks had um, moved there in the previous decades as well. There was some sense of kind of harmonious relationship because the, the even though the ethnic groups were different, the class structure kind of uh, dovetailed reasonably well. So it was a well-integrated neighborhood that suffered, you know, some significant problems moving into the 50s as you had larger families moving, being displaced from the South End. Um, moving into the area. This was also the time in the 1950s where uh, this was the beginning of the really the kind of the close relations between the Jewish community and the black community during the civil rights era too, which was really um, significant at the time. So as the uh, lower income folks and, and other black families moving um, into uh, Washington Park and closer to Franklin Park, um, created some of the, um, some, you know, there was some culture and lifestyle clashes that were happening. Uh, some of the institutions um, in, in the Roxbury area decided to depart. 
Um, initially, Hebrew College in the early 50s decided to uh, move out to, to Brookline and they kind of followed uh, along with the other institutions were kind of following the Jewish middle class and upper middle class uh, that were gradually locating at the time out to, to Brookline, to Brighton, to Newton and elsewhere. Um, Michigan to Phila um, closed down in 1955. Uh, Hebrew Education Alliance, Hebrew College, all moved out um, in this time period. And what this, this signaled, I think, three very important things. Uh, one is the, the upper middle class and middle class Jews and the institutions that, um, you know, they were very close to uh, kind of signaled that they were uh, kind of losing faith in the old neighborhood and were deciding, you know, to leave. They weren't interested anymore. That also um, uh, signaled to uh, other city leaders and the, the black community in the area that, that Jews are on their way out. So this is a, a place where we can um, uh, continue to move as well. Um, and yeah, so those were kind of the, oh, and also uh, as um, black families moved to the South, it changed some of the grading from the, the Hulk maps that I described before. Um, you know, this became graded as a D neighborhood. So there was even less investment going into the neighborhood. So it really kind of helped to destabilize um, this portion of uh, Roxbury as well. So another diagram to kind of show what was uh, the population shifts that were occurring then. Um, so in the 50s, as a, a lot of the middle and upper middle class, in essence, were moving, middle class Jews were moving to the, uh, to the Western suburbs. Um, more of the uh, lower middle and, and working class Jews wanted to remain close to the synagogues, the other institutions, and to remain in a, in a Jewish community. And, um, you know, moving, they, there was that kind of gradual movement uh, to the south. Um, many left, but then more and more moved into the south. But, you know, in, in aggregate, the net loss in just that 10 year period was about uh, 30,000 Jews. Uh, from RDM uh, during uh, the 1950s. And you can see that the, the black population really uh, doubled uh, with the population increase with the shift from the South End um, into the area. Um, this was uh, quite, a, quite a dramatic shift. So as the, um, you know, as the black community especially was unable to get loans to purchase homes, many of the residents moved into the small apartment buildings and the triple deckers uh, in Roxbury and in parts of Dorchester at this point. And many of those buildings uh, were owned by uh, older Jews. Um, they had lived, um, who had previously lived there obviously and had rented the other Jewish families in the early sixties. Many of these buildings were 40, 50 years old by this time become run, run down. Uh, the Jewish property owners uh, in ver invested very little in these buildings. Uh, due, I think, to concerns of the shifting demographic, but also many of them, because of the federal uh, housing policies, weren't able to get loans um, as well to uh, for significant upkeep and renovations at the time. So whereas many Jews and Blacks together really had lived harmoniously in the area in the 40s and the early 50s, the you know, bitterness started to arise in the 50s and early 60s, especially amongst the Black tenants towards most of the Jewish uh, property owners who um, were called slumlords, I think, with, from what I read without hesitation. Um, there were tenant unions um, that were formed that protested some of the uh, blighted conditions in Roxbury in the 60s. There were incidents of rent strikes. Uh, there were harassments of landlords uh, in order to kind of promote action uh, and investments um, in these older buildings. And that resentment reached a relative peak in 1967, um, when there was unrest um, that resulted from a, uh, a, a demonstration in front of Grove Hall. And after that unrest, it resulted in, um, uh, in the immediate aftermath were, were arson attacks against a number of uh, Roxbury's Jewish owned businesses. Uh, and there were reports of uh, shop owners and uh, bystanders beaten, beaten by mobs as well. And it was really in this time period that the first calls um, by uh, activists really in the Roxbury area, the first calls for uh, black ownership of uh, Roxbury's housing, its businesses and institutions 
these arose from the community and from a newly formed uh, group called the uh, Black United uh, Front Organization. It was 1968 um, was also a kind of a pivotal shift in the political culture in Boston. It was uh, that year that the first um, the first uh, Black city councilor was uh, elected, Thomas Atkins, you see there, and also uh, Mayor Kevin White. And, um, you know, they were intent on moving away from the, the major emphasis in the previous two administrations on revitalization and urban renewal in the, in the um, downtown uh, financial district and uh, back Bay area. And they really wanted to uh, focus more on neighborhood issues. This was the late 60s. You kind of imagine um, uh, there was more of that focus to, towards communities and, and away from biz big business. And the, there's a real focus on poverty and rising crime uh, in the Roxbury area. And they really wanted to find a way um, to not only help the community, but to avoid any additional unrest uh, that had occurred after the uh, MLK assassination in April of 1968. There was some unrest in Boston, not as much as many others, but there was some real concern um, that that might happen even more so in Boston. 1968 also happened to be the year, very important at the federal level, the Federal Housing Authority finally, after 30 years, uh, changed its policies and would no longer uh, use race and ethnic-based criteria in order to um, issue federally backed loans. So it was that kind of confluence of things, the sort of change in federal highway, uh, or federal housing authority policy, sorry, um, and the changes in the administration and their new emphasis um, that brought up the, um, the idea of recreating or, or creating the Boston Bank's Urban Renewal uh, Group or BBRG in, in late 1968 with the purpose of initiating a sweeping program designed to expand home ownership opportunities for black residents of Boston. The well-intentioned program uh, had $50 million available in easy to qualify loans with minimal down payment for black residents. And these loans were insured and guaranteed by, by FHA because again, their policy had changed. Now they were insuring and guaranteeing loans even in the previous uh, redlined uh, areas. So for all intents purposes for any participating bank, it was a nearly risk-free investment. Uh, Beberg then, the, the group created a strict borderline around, you see in red there, around the you know, roughly 10,000 Jews uh, in the core of Dorchester, Mattapan, and de de determined that the Beberg program would only lend to black families within the area shown in red. They claim, you know, claiming that they wanted to protect the home value of their customers, the bank's customers. Uh, elsewhere, the Beberg Bank's policy was that no loan, no matter what, would be made to any Black families looking to purchase homes in any of the nearby working class Catholic neighborhoods, any of the white middle class neighborhoods, or certainly in any of the adjacent suburbs. So with that policy and that program uh, instituted and a, a, board, a strict borderline that you see there that uh, people in the community and leaders, both uh, Black and Jewish community leaders were unaware of, almost immediately, dozens of real estate offices and, uh, and from what I read, 200 realtors uh, kind of set up shop on Blue Hill Avenue to accommodate the, the uh, crush of new home buyers in Mattapan. And with the mortgage insurance and loan guarantees fully covered by the, the Federal um, Housing Authority um, administration, I mean, realtors understood that they were in competition with each other to sell the most homes the most quickly because they relied on Jews selling the triple deckers and the two families and single family homes to black residents, the realtors incorporated what's called block busting techniques. So block busting um, involved realtors and their use of racially charged scare tactics to promote panic selling of homes at a low cost. And because black families could only secure mortgages in the Beeberg zone, it was really only a matter of time until at least one black family moved on to every block which was the perfect time for the real estate agents to uh, really kind of push these, these scare tactics. Um, so to give you a sense of what blockbusting is all about, um, you know, I have a couple, some example 
script here. Uh, residents who lived in that Beeberg zone on almost a daily or certainly a weekly basis were getting letters um, and uh, were receiving phone calls from realtors really kind of, you know, with these scare tactics, uh, using literally these, um, using these scripts. And that fear mongering, it, it worked. One could argue it worked. It was successful in a sense that, um, uh, you know, thousands of the Jewish residents, especially by this time, there was many um, uh, elderly, um, elderly residents didn't have a, um, uh, you know, working class elderly didn't have like large savings, uh, were fearful um, and, um, you know, quickly left. And the way, you know, a, a way that many of the bankers made lots of money is they would, using these scare tactics, they would uh, take a house that was maybe appraised at $15,000, haha, 15, right? Uh, but 15, you know, some of these homes, $15,000 at the time uh, with the scare tactic to get the older Jewish residents to sell the house for let's say 10 or even $12,000 and then turn around and sell it to uh, a black family for $20,000. So the, the realtors involved um, in the Beeberg program and the banks uh, involved uh, made some you know, pretty huge profits as I'm sure you, you can imagine. So in many ways, in terms of the aftermath of this, the block busting and the Beeberg program, which is such an important uh, part of the history of the Jewish community in RDM, one could argue in some ways the goals were achieved. There were thousands of first time homeowners from the black community coming from, uh, from Roxbury mostly or the South End who moved into the Dorchester and Mattapan Beeberg zone and elsewhere. You can see how in just a four year period, uh, the changes in demographics from 11,000 Jews to 2,500, uh, the Irish Catholic uh, communities in the area, they tended to stick around a bit more uh, for various reasons, but you could see the, you know, the expansion of the black population into the Beeberg zone you know, increased uh, 11 times in that area or in that time period, sorry. Um, because the loans were federally backed um, the, and the banks were all but guaranteed almost to make profit from it because of the federal guarantees, uh, a lot of these home, a lot of the homes at the time were sold to families that probably didn't really have enough money to afford that home or didn't, uh, because they weren't required to have down payments, they were lacking capital for for upkeep for any investment. So there's, you know, for a number of reasons within only a short period of time, um, the foreclosure rate on uh, the properties in the Beeberg zone reached uh, roughly 50%. Um, and as, and some of the families without really putting a down payment um, and only living there a couple of years simply just walked away. Uh, others, there were uh, acts of arson um, uh, at the time for insurance money, there's certainly a good number of examples there. Uh, and this increased the, the vacancies, of course, and the blight uh, throughout, the uh, throughout the neighborhood. And this, you know, the fleeing of the, of the community and the fleeing of, of the capital, uh, so to speak, uh, impacted, uh, ultimately impacted Blue Hill Avenue as well. Uh, by 1970 and into the early 70s, there were a lot more uh, vacant businesses boarded up storefronts, the two uh, primary uh, grocery stores uh, along Blue Hill Ave uh, had closed as well. And it became um, you know, a, a more blighted area uh, that fewer um, of the Jewish residents, the ones that remained even felt comfortable uh, going to. So setting the stage by 1970, you know, all of the institutions and uh, synagogues had closed really north of Woodrow Avenue, which still kind of held on as um, the, the core of what was now three or 4,000 uh, Jews left in the uh, early 70s in, uh, in, uh, in RDM. It's really mostly M, Mattapan, uh, really at this point. Uh, but it was also at this time period that, um, uh, that the racial animosity and uh, anti-Semitism really kind of re, um, you know, showed its ugly head and kind of reached a peak in this time period. Uh, in 1969, uh, one of the few uh, shuls that were left, there was maybe eight or nine in the area, uh, the young rabbi uh, at his home, um, two assailants uh, rang the doorbell, he opened the doorbell and they, they threw a um, hydrochloric acid into his face. 
um, what was what's called in the newspaper article an acid bomb. Perhaps you call it a bomb, perhaps not, but that acid, you know, severely burned his face uh, and his eyes. He was uh, severely injured, but but did survive. Um, and they also dropped a note um, that said, uh, lead the racist Jews out of Mattapan and sort of ran off. So it was really obviously a horrible attack. And whereas um, the, you know, the Jewish institutions in the Boston area and the city government hadn't really paid too much attention to what was going on with the Beeper program. And as uh, many of the uh, Jewish families were kind of leaving, departing the neighborhood and there, the de destabilization caused by the, uh, the Beeper program was happening, it was you know, somewhat ignored by policymakers. This all of a sudden drew a lot and the media and this, this drew uh, a lot of uh, media attention as I'm sure uh, you can imagine. Less than a year later now, so we're talking about 1970, uh, two synagogues uh, only a block apart were the victims of uh, arson attacks in 1970 at the Orthodox uh, Hever Shas. You see uh, at the bottom left there, assailants broke in um, and set fire to the ark, uh, destroying two of the Torahs that lay within. This is a funeral for, uh, a photo from the funeral for two of the Torahs that were um, buried at a, a near by synagogue. Um, a few weeks later then, a firebomb was thrown through the front window of the Aguda Sephard that luckily burned itself out quickly, um, caused only about $10,000 in, in damage. But as one can imagine, the community was you know, really uh, you know, terrified uh, by what was going on. And whereas the ongoing, uh, as I said before, as the ongoing Beeberg efforts uh, that were destabilizing the neighborhood were all but ignored, all of a sudden these arsons through a lot of media uh, attention and City Hall uh, and the regional uh, Jewish leaders uh, all of a sudden really put a lot of focus into the plight of the remaining Jewish community and some of the uh, ongoing acts of violence and uh, anti-Semitism. So with regards to the um, uh, the Jewish communities, from my reading, uh, the Jewish, I'm sorry, not communities, institutions, from my readings, there was really some dispute related to the reaction from the institutions such as uh, CJP, um, Consolidated Jewish uh, Philanthropies and other Jewish leaders in the region that CJP and others ultimately did provide housing relocation services for elderly, the elderly Jews who are more working class, who remained, found apartments for them, helped, and then built a small, um, uh, C and, and built senior housing in Brighton and Newton and elsewhere. They also funded a small Jewish community center on Blue Hill Ave in 1969. Yet many of the residents that, from what I read, really felt abandoned and that, that the programs in the late 60s, early 70s were too little too late. They suspected that the institutions and their leaders were just far too concerned with the well-off Jews uh, that were living in the suburbs and easily ignoring the plight of the, uh, the plight of the poor and the elderly and the uh, uh, working class that were stuck in the old neighborhood. Others thought that because the tensions were so tied into racial issues, the Jewish institutional leaders were hesitant to inflame an already tense atmosphere between the Jewish and the black communities at the time and risk the strong relationships that really had been advanced during the civil rights, uh, civil rights struggle um, at a Tay Day in the 50s and, and early 60s. So at this time with, the, um, with that ongoing violence, um, there was a visit from uh, Rabbi Meyer Kahane, who perhaps some of you um, uh, have heard of, and uh, uh, a local branch of the Jewish Defense League was found, uh, was founded, uh, had 150 uh, members who volunteered to kind of escort the elderly Jews in the area. As you can see, the crime rates um, uh, in the area went up uh, so much, much, much higher in Mattapan than uh, in other parts of Boston. And uh, the uh, the uh, Jewish Defense League folks were out there helping for a number of months and that kind of faded out, but thought that was interesting. Um, so I think that, you know, one of the things that was interesting, another book that I uh, did read, I didn't mention before, Jews in a Changing Neighborhood was really a, um, a thesis project uh, by a, a Harvard student um, that really wanted to uh, explore how the Jews who were left in Mattapan in the early 1970s, how they felt about the neighborhood and how they felt about their, their new neighbors, the community 
that was moving in. And, and uh, Yona Ginsburg uh, discovered that there was a lot of, you ask a hundred Jews, of course, what their opinion, you're gonna get a whole lot of different, uh, different answers. Um, but you know, the, uh, uh, you found uh, a number of uh, interesting findings. One is that of the hundred uh, uh, Jewish residents who remained, a high percentage, 39, um, had been recent crime victims. So that was, that was pretty, um, uh, you know, obviously a high level. Many of them did, were very supportive of integration in the neighborhood. They were kind of happy um, and were very open to integration, but many were concerned, those that remained, that they would be you know, the, the last Jewish family or the last Jewish house on the street. So they wanted a mix, but um, were, got nervous when they became one of the last one, uh, last white or Jewish families on the street. And found that the people who remained, there were certain class distinctions that the folks who remained had an appreciation and like the more, uh, their more middle class neighbors that lived in the single family or two family houses, um, but were more distrustful of those living in apartments and parts of Dorchester um, and elsewhere who you know, came to use the, uh, the businesses along Blue Hill Avenue as well. There's a lot of media driven stereotypes, nearly everyone interviewed were pushed by friends and family to get out of Mattapan. It was uh, considered a combat zone for all intents and purposes by the media. And like a lot of neighborhoods, there were good blocks and there were bad blocks, but there was some you know, resentment about uh, the media stereotypes that were created. And as I discussed before, strong opinions that I kind of highlighted before about the Jewish um, institutions, but most strongly what people felt is that there was a real resentment um, resentment related to the effects of redlining and blockbusting and the Feeberg program um, that um, people were understanding more and more. And I think that, you know, of all the issues there, I think that's one that you know, I think clearly is, is uh, I can understand the most and is, is probably the most significant in many ways. I think that, you know, that, that uh, black families, black households were denied the opportunity uh, over a many year period, certainly a number of decades and even into the, the Beatbird program to buy homes in a neighborhood that they preferred or uh, wanted to move into other than just a, really a pretty small area where only Jews were concentrated is perhaps you know, one of the most tragic aspects of, of this whole story. Because I think that had um, you know, arguably a negative impact on both the black community and the Jewish community in the RDM during, during this time period. So I am, I'm at about an hour now and I'm coming towards the end because uh, I know there's probably a good number of questions. Uh, um, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot here to digest and I know I've thrown a lot, of, um, uh, a lot of numbers out too in terms of, you know, when uh, communities move from which neighborhood, from which uh, city out to different areas. But I thought I would just, you know, diagram uh, the various population, the cumulative Jewish population uh, in greater Boston, because I think that's kind of interesting. And, you know, in that time period, the 50, 1950 to 1970 uh, time period, you know, just as there was the dramatic depopulating of RDM, and you can see up until 1950 that the vast majority of the Jewish population in greater Boston was either in the North or West End or in RDM. But after that, um, obviously, uh, fewer and fewer people were tied to the old RDM neighborhood. And the, the overall population grew uh, quite significantly in the 60s and 70s into the 80s and 90s um, with you know, the growth of uh, healthcare industries, uh, 128 corridor, high tech, the uh, Russian immigrants when they were allowed to leave in the 80s. And you know, more recently, I think uh, Israeli immigrants um, to uh, greater Boston as well. It's kind of led us to a point where now historically we're at about 250,000 uh, Jews in the greater Boston area. And I think, you know, thinking about the what could have been is always kind of a, a dangerous thing, but, you know, we kind of, th this diagram I thought uh, after I made it sort of, you know, went kind of full circle to that uh, map diagram I made earlier where there was this, you know, large, you know, large void, one could argue in the community. And that void that I show there in the lighter blue, you know, it, it, it certainly was a void of people and the congregations in those particular synagogues that moved out to uh, you know, suburban areas, both the sort of first tier suburbs like Brookline and Newton, but then you know, more the second tier 
suburbs for Jewish suburbs, you know, Sharon, parts of Framingham, Marblehead, um, and elsewhere. But what I wanted to emphasize here is that, you know, there is still that legacy. It's not completely a void. There's that built legacy of synagogues that remain um, in the neighborhood. And I just wanted to kind of conclude the next five minutes with a little tour of some of the buildings that are still there. And um, for those of you that don't get down into uh, Roxbury, Dorchester, Mattapan very much, uh, you know, perhaps you should go and just you know, look at some of the, the old synagogue buildings there because some of them are quite beautiful, uh, both in their totality, but even in some of the details. Um, it, you know, they're kind of easy to miss, um, but you will notice, you know, all of them have been, uh, those that remain, I think pretty much all of them have been converted to churches, but uh, if you look really closely when you see an old church that you'll still see um, some Hebrew lettering, you'll see Stars of David, you'll see uh, the uh, Ten Commandments, Moses' Ten Commandments, of course. Um, the, uh, the image from the first slide of the presentation, uh, Adath Jeshrun, the Blue Hill Avenue Shoal, that is certainly still there. Uh, it's a beautiful old building still. It's now the First Haitian Baptist Church. It's still um, quite a presence, um, physical presence near Grove Hall. Uh, in Roxbury. Uh, some of the, the congregation uh, Chai Odam, uh, I thought was interesting. It's probably one of the larger buildings you'll see on just a, a narrow residential street. It's still there. You can see the, the sign is a bit awkwardly placed on top of the, the old grill work and the, the congregation name, um, but you see some of that uh, detail that's still there. And you know the old synagogues come in all sizes, shapes, materials. You know, there's some that are kind of, you know, more modernist kind of boxy buildings like uh, Kehillith Jacob. And this was, as far as I could tell, the last synagogue that remains um, in Mattapan and Dorchester in 1973, they finally uh, moved out. Um, anyway, you could see there's some, you know, some of the old synagogue buildings are wood frame. Some are kind of tucked behind houses, like you see uh, young Israel, Mattapan. And of course, you know, a, a handful of, uh, the nice old synagogue buildings have been lost, have been demolished. The Temple of Bethel, Bethel was the most significant in the research uh, that I did. Um, it was uh, the, the community departed in 1965 and it became a church. The church then departed in, uh, I think, the, um, close to in the 1990s. And eventually the whole building was uh, sadly demolished and is now just a two family house. Um, but that's, you know, so the legacy of what used to be there, it's always kind of important to keep that in mind. And then just, you know, finally, kind of the, really in many ways, the, one could say the grand dom um, of the synagogue buildings uh, in the RDM neighborhood, uh, Michigan Tefillah, has just a, a really fascinating um, history as uh, the conservative congregation kind of broke off uh, from uh, some of the older uh, congregations in the South End uh, and built this temple in 1915, where they uh, enjoyed the facility for 43 years as uh, Mishkan Tefillah. Um, as they moved out to, in, when in the departure of the, um, at the time period when some of those institutions were departing in 1958, they went out to uh, Newton and uh, sold the building to the Lubavitch uh, Hasinim community, who established a day school and synagogue, they, um, they were not a wealthy uh, community and had trouble maintaining the large synagogue building, uh, especially the interior space. Um, and ultimately in, in an act that the CJP kind of worked um, with the uh, Hasidic community to relocate their school and synagogue out to Brookline. And then the building was given to Elma, Luna, Elma Lewis in 1968 um, to form the National Center for African American Arts, which did not do very well financially for a time period in 1980, that closed down. And for, for a good 20 years, uh, the building um, remained abandoned. Um, it, there were uh, obviously massive uh, vandalism inside, lots of graffiti, rain that came through. There was uh, nesting birds apparently in the old uh, holy Ark of the building. Um, but, you know, the good news here, and maybe some of you know this and, and perhaps have seen it, um, but the good news here is the story ends well, at least for Michigan to fill in the, and the building, and that 
Uh, the building was restored uh, in 2000. There was, uh, it received a uh, historic preservation grant. Um, an African-American church uh, and some private donors were involved uh, in the restoration. And I haven't been inside, but I have been on the outside. It's just, it's really an amazing building across from the uh, Franklin Park Zoo. And this, this congregation, you know, helped to revitalize not only that corner of Roxbury, but, you know, retained one of the Boston Jewish community's most visible and iconic buildings. Uh, it's a wonderful uh, building to see if you can get in, even, even better. Uh, but I um, encourage people to visit this and some of the other uh, synagogue buildings as well. It's kind of a fascinating history. Uh, I hope you did learn something here uh, regarding to the history of the old RDM neighborhood and the, the Jewish diaspora in general in Boston. And I thank you for your patience for this long presentation. And I'm happy to take questions for the next, I guess, 15 or 20 minutes. Okay, so if you, thank you, Phil. If yeah. you wanna get rid of your presentation, we can see everybody's oh. faces. Uh, yes. That would be yes. very helpful. Yes. And, ah, and now I see have, there's 39 people. I didn't. Yeah. <laughs> if, uh, if people have um, any questions and you wanna unmute yourself or comment, um, please do so. I don't have to call on you if anybody just, has anything to I just say. Want Go ahead, Joyce. Phil, it was a wonderful presentation and I know a lot of effort went into this and uh, I appreciate this very much because it sort of anchors a lot of my experiences in um, your presentation, having lived in the area, as <laughs> I said before. I, if you have any questions for me, actually, about daily living in the oh, area. Yeah, did I get anything wrong? <laughs> <laughs> you know, your reference to children that's one thing. The street was filled with children, and uh, you you didn't have play dates. You just called on your friend from the street to come out and play, and uh, that was just common in all the streets. Lots of kids. That's great. Yeah, Martin. Um, I, first of all, thank you very much. I think this is the best presentation I've seen uh, about the community. So, Kola uh, Kabot. But secondly, early on in your in your presentation, you showed a section called the New York Streets. I've I've lived here a very long time. I've never heard that term. Where are the New York Streets? Uh, the New York Streets are you know five or six, or they were five or six blocks that all uh, were named after different cities in New York. So Albany Street is one of the kind of legacy streets still there. But there was a Rochester Street. There was a Troy Street, there was a handful of others named after New York City. Um, and that was in, in one of the first urban renewal projects in the early 50s. That was all cleaned out uh, in order to provide space for the Boston Herald's um, printing operations and offices. Um, about the Traveler Street? For, what's that? You talk about Traveler Street and south, you know, south of Chinatown across the pike? Yeah. Just, yeah, just south of the pike. It's now you know, it's 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 this booming the, the the herald is no longer there but right. it's some of the most expensive real estate now in the in this uh the lower south end is just sort of booming with new condos so okay thank you yeah anybody um, else I, have yep go ahead yeah i had a question um <clears throat> it's a very very interesting presentation and thank you so much for all the obvious work that you did going into this my question is the map that you showed that had, for lack of a better term, the letter grades of the various neighborhoods yeah. showed that the Brookline area was an A, Newton area was a B. But when the Jews started moving to Brookline, were those people who were there receptive of the Jews or was there any kind of um, strife or, or tension um, with these, you know, Jews moving yeah. into their lovely Protestant neighborhoods? Yeah, <laughs> you know, that's, that's a great question and an area of research I have not explored, but it would be a really interesting one. I, in everything that I read and researched, um, I, I didn't see anything related to how the folks in Brookline and Newton, and I'm sure you know, Newton, probably at the time, there's a lot of farmland, a lot of um, 
you know, there probably wasn't too much of a population out there, but certainly in Brookline, there was, you know, many thousands of people who were there as, as the Jewish population, middle class Jewish population started moving there in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. And uh, I don't know how they were received. Uh, that's a that's a great question. Uh, just a little background. My dad was um, of the um, Blue Hill Avenue Jews, and my mom was uh -huh. of the Chelsea Jews. But okay. she actually ended up going to Brookline High because her family moved to Brookline. So An intermarriage, I don't know. Yeah. I know, I yeah. know it's yeah. a no. horrible thing. No, it was a good thing, actually. <laughs> yeah, well, for yeah. me, it was. Yeah. So thank Anybody you. else have a, thank you. Anybody else want to share a story or ask a question? So. Did I hear a voice? Yeah. Oh, Shirley, go ahead. Yeah, I, I grew up in Newton Center, but I was in Newton Center growing up as I was watching the population move from uh, Dorchester and Mattapan. Um, and, um, but um, like when I was in kindergarten or first grade, there were just a few children in my class right in the middle of Newton Center and the Rice and then the Mason School. Um, who were Jewish, and by the time I was in sixth grade, um, there were only two children who were not Jewish. <laughs> wow. <in the> class. <laughs> but um, uh, also, I my mother used to shop on Blue Hill Avenue and all the way up and down Blue, Blue Hill Avenue. And um, but um, the end, the uh, crime rate became so high. Um, in the Georgia Mattapan area, that really the Jewish community had to, um, uh, you know, like uh, bring the uh, elderly who couldn't afford to move on their own uh, to uh, to Brighton, uh, yeah. but uh, they had to be saved. Yes. Wow. Mm -hmm. So I, I was saying before we uh, started that um, uh, I, I went to a girls Latin school that was in Dorchester and talk about how you said everybody went shopping on Blue Hill Avenue when I used to go to school, um, uh, not by bus when I had a, was old enough to have a license. It was like, if you're going to go drive on Blue Hill Avenue, my parents told me you had to lock all the doors and, you know, you had to make sure you weren't there for very long and, you know, don't go to the back streets and such like that. So it was, it was much in my era, it was a very dangerous place to be. Yeah. Well, um, they, uh, if you had your window open when you stopped your car in the 70s, I remember, you uh, could have the gold neck uh, chain pulled off your, uh, pulled off your neck. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's making all it's all making a comeback. I mean, you know, every time they say Nubian Square, I go, what's that? I know, exactly. I have to think too. <laughs> yeah. um, um, I was just curious just, about just uh, Martin, I'm sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to answer there was an interesting question in the, the chat. Oh good. Uh, from Roberta related oh. to um, you know, were were blacks included in the GI mortgages? Um, and you know, black GIs, unlike white GIs. Um, the Veterans Administration and the uh, Federal Housing Authority basically did not offer uh, Black returning GIs uh, mortgages uh, to buy new homes um, at the same rate, not even close to the same rate as the white family. So to me, it's just one of the one of the tragedies of the you know racial history of this country is that you know in, in World War II and really many of our wars we had we had African Americans uh, fighting. You know, on our side, fighting, fighting Nazis, fighting for the Union, etc. And after the war ended, they came back to the U.S. and didn't have, and were denied their rights in a serious way. So, um, one way, certainly after World War II, is they weren't able to take advantage of the low interest loans and federally uh, guaranteed uh, mortgages through the uh, through the VA uh, to purchase homes. And, and I don't know the answer to the other one, Grove Hill Savings Bank, were they involved in redlining? I think all banks really in Boston and really throughout the United States, you know, benefited in some ways from redlining because the, the FHA federal government really established these maps that kind of, you know, set the policy 
for um, lending institutions uh, and the the you know the best rates available for people uh, yeah. to get mortgages depending on the neighborhood. So okay, Martin, that was it was called it was called the Grove Hall Savings Bank. Uh, so oh, Grove Hall, Whoops. right? Yeah. And then of course, yeah. So, so my 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 question is that in the Levine and Harmon book that they mentioned quite a few Jews that were um, involved in this redlining. They were uh, president yeah. owned, owned banks, lawyers, real estate brokers. And in fact, they named names in the book. And this is <laughs> during the time where these people are still alive and they were getting quite a bit of hate mail and so on because it, uh, he named, he outed them, if you will, about, yeah. did, did, did you discover any of that in your, in your research? Uh, well, primarily in the book, because obviously I read the book, I read it twice. <laughs> um, and, you know, took a lot of notes. And obviously, if, if you read the book, as Martin, it sounds like you have, you know, you'll sort of note that, you know, much of my presentation, and some of the anecdotes do come from from that book. But um, yeah, I didn't really see too much in the other research I did, you know, it tended not to focus on naming names in quite the same way, unless it was obviously elected officials like Kevin White or something like that. Um, so I didn't see too much of that. And I know one of the names, I forget all the names, of course, but one of the sort of outed names, Martin, um, that you probably recall from the book is one of the primary developers even of the West End or what what the aftermath of the West End and the kind of housing towers yeah, that replaced the old Jewish and ethnic um, uh, neighborhood where uh, it was a development company owned by Jews as well. So I know that was one that was, that was brought up too. Yeah. The Jews were complicit. I think I saw Maida, you had your yeah. hand up. Yeah, I was I was just going to uh, thank you so much for flushing out information that had um, about the urban renewal that caused the uh, population shifts. I did a fascinating tour into that area with the synagogue council. I don't know, 10, 12 years ago, something like that. And I actually got uh, inside um, the the building that was um, um, the KI. So, um, but what I wanted to ask you about was they left me with the impression that um, when things got very, very bad, um, one of the places that the remnants of the community went was further south into Randolph, sure. especially. So I just wondered if you didn't, you didn't mention that. So I was just wondering if that worked in what you were saying. Uh, and of course that community has shifted again now, but right. that, that, that was, that's what was suggested. Yeah, I do know. Um, and next I want, next would be Beverly and then Stephen, but I do want to answer the question. Um, I do know, you know, in the early seventies when there was still a, a few thousand Jews in Mattapan, mostly the south, uh, sort of south half of Mattapan, uh, parts of Mattapan that were more the single family homes closer to Mattapan Square. Um, as they decided to leave, they felt so strongly connected to the neighborhood. Some did want to at least stay close. So instead of going out to you know, maybe the western suburbs of Framingham or to Newton or, or to the North Shore, uh, many of them just you know skipped over the uh, the city line into Milton or places like Randolph. Um, so I, I did read specifically that there were um, communities of Jews who did want to stay tied to in some way to the old J uh, Jewish neighborhood by staying as close as possible. And many of them were the ones that went to, Rand I think Randolph was more of a working class community, those that yes. couldn't necessarily afford to go to to uh, Newton or Brookline. Um, or Sharon, yeah. Um, or Sharon. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Great. Good question. Uh, right. Beverly and Stephen. Yeah. And then Leslie. Okay. Thanks. Beverly, Stephen, Leslie. Yep. Oh, should I go first? Yes. Go ahead, yes. Beverly. Yes. Uh, you know, we were one of the um, one of the first Jewish families that moved into Newton um, in the mid '40s, and I always felt that our neighbors were not very happy that the house was sold to a Jewish family. That's an answer to Sandra's uh, question. Uh, but um, my mother would always say, shush, don't make too much noise. She didn't want us to disturb the neighbors. <laughs> so we couldn't really act so freely as children outside when we played because we were always aware that we shouldn't um, 
we, we shouldn't attract attention to ourselves and make it uncomfortable for the neighbors. And um, I know one of the little girls once blurted out dirty Jew. So you know that came from the home. But I think those were the times. I think times have changed now where, um, you know, people are um, more accepting of uh, different religions. I know even the little boys in, uh, from Dorchester and Roxbury, mm -hmm. they beaten up by some of these Catholic uh, children. Um, I think they'll tell you stories like yeah. that. Well, yeah. they're used to, from what I, in my research, I read about some kind of big rumbles that used to occur in Franklin Park, which was really kind of a melting pot of, uh, you know, in the mid-century melting pot of, you know, Jews who were living to the immediate north and the east, Catholics that were uh, living mostly to the, to the west, um, and then, and some of the, uh, and the black community that was to the north as well. And, and at times there were kind of big fights amongst, you know, teenagers and young people in Franklin Beverly, Park. So I know that that was part of the reality. Yeah. Beverly knew my parents. Yes. Yeah, and, right. um, you know, yeah, my dad right. used to, my dad, my dad would, would tell stories of the, the tough Irish kids who'd beat the crap mm -hmm. out of them. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. But I mean, maybe they didn't carry on like that in Newton, but there definitely was an underlying sense of anti-Semitism. Yeah. But I just want to say about Blue Hill Avenue, that was the most wonderful place to visit. You know, Harvard Street never is, was never the same as Blue Hill Avenue. Yeah. I mean, yeah. people would just go there to stroll at night and go into the g, &G restaurant to socialize. And it was just a wonderful community type of feeling. And I don't think we have that atmosphere and Harvard Street, not, not the same. No. I, I don't think it was ever recreated. Yep. Hey, Steve. Steve and then Leslie. So a couple of things. Number one, uh, thank you. Great presentation. <laughs> um, yes. Uh, and, and I think that that uh, I always thought that Hillel Levine's work was very much under underappreciated. You know, around the same time he wrote this book, Rabbi Paley actually called a Beit Din on the Jewish slumlords. Um, didn't get very far, but Jewish activism around this was, was important. The other point was simply that, that when all these people, a lot of these people left, they came to my territory, they came to Nantasket. Okay. And, and uh, Temple Beth Shalom in Nantasket had about, uh, anywhere from 500 to 700 Jewish families um, who moved into their, their parents' mm -hmm. summer houses mm -hmm. until they found out that, that the heating oil, heating oil prices went up and they stayed there. And then this is the last point, um, Sandra, about, the, about where we can move. My family ended up moving to Natick because mm -hmm. Natick, Natick allowed them and they, and they could move to Framingham, but they weren't moving to Sudbury. They weren't moving to Wellesley. They weren't moving to, Sher to Sherbin. They weren't moving to Dover. But they're there now. <laughs> now they're there. Now they're there. <laughs> yeah. okay. Let, nice Leslie. Good, Leslie good. And, then, and then Alan. Yeah, okay. Now, uh, yeah, I, I knew of another place in either, I don't know if it was Dorchester or Mattapan, called the Hecht House. I, I never oh, went yes. there myself, but my yeah. cousin who was, you know, a few years older than me, he went, I, I think, was it a kind of community center? It was like a JCC. A JCC. And it, it, did move, it did move to Brighton. Oh, did it? Oh, okay. And now it's a different kind of a community center from a different organization. Yeah. Okay, yeah. thanks. And back in the, yeah. It was a settlement house, too, for immigrants back in the day. Right. Right. Teach English classes, help folks get yeah. a job. When I went, I went to Camp Kingswood in Maine, Bridgeton, Maine, and it was a, it's a Jewish camp and it's now run by the JCCs. But the first year you had to drive to the Hecht House in, in Dorchester to catch the bus. Uh -huh. And the next year you had to go to Brighton to catch the bus. Uh -huh. So yeah. uh, it was right in that area. Yeah, interesting. Okay, okay. yeah, no, thanks for, for presenting this and putting it all together, Phil. It was, yep. yeah, very yeah. interesting. Alan and then, I want to meet him maybe after that. So. I just want to add, uh, first of all, I want to thank, thank you for the wonderful presentation. It was very nostalgic for me in as much mm -hmm. as I was born in Mattapan in 44 and didn't leave there until 61. So mm -hmm. a lot of what you had said and talked about, I experienced. But mm -hmm. just a bit of nostalgia that really 
I wanted to touch upon was the high holidays in the Mattapan, Dorchester, Roxbury area. All the shows would get out at the same time in the uh, afternoon, and everyone would go down to Franklin Field and sit on the wall. Oh. <laughs> and there would be the great gathering of the Jewish youth meeting mm -hmm. and reacquainting with their friends from that moved away or were around. It was a wonderful neighborhood and the doors were always open. It was fabulous. It's a shame to have seen that era pass away and never to be replicated. It is, when I first heard about the wall, I was just amazed by it. I thought it was, it was almost moving to me. I thought it was just so, so, so cool that there, there would be a, a neighborhood with so many Jews and such a concentrated area and they would all come to that one place. You know, whether you're two blocks away or whether you're a mile away, I thought that was just fascinating. Yeah. And you'd have like the Orthodox kids in one area and then, you know, the, the kids from, you know, anyway, I, I liked how that people kind of divided themselves into different subgroups there too and went to different parts of the wall, so. Well, it was very important for the girls because these yeah. were our dis display years. I like that term. Yeah. And we would, we would parade uh, in with groups. You didn't go by yourself. You went with your clique yeah. in, uh, in front of the wall. And, you know, it, it was the time where you appreciated a warm, a warm mm -hmm. response, not like today, where no one was yeah. to be accused of harassment. <laughs> we yeah, went well, with a little harassment. Growing watch, up. That, watch that film sidewalk memories they there's definitely a, uh, a handful of folks who reminisce about uh, being at the wall and they show some some photographs as well um, I, I, thought I, was, I think I think I should mention something about the Shama theater that was um, Saturday afternoon you know the kids would go for a quarter and you'd see <laughs> you'd see Two, two main features. One was a serial usually, and the world news. And for many people, that's where you got your news because Movie Tone, I think, would show uh, the news of the week. And um, of course, I was there during the war years. So that was the real exposure and uh, the center of the community in many ways. And I still have some of the depression glass pieces that were given out on occasion. Um, my mom, when my mother went and, uh, you know, cake dishes and so on. So now they're <laughs> antiques. <laughs> yeah. As am I, I guess. <laughs> Steven, did you have yeah. another question? Thank you. I, no, I just wanted to make, make people aware, make sure they know about the Weiner Center. Um, that's now at the New England Genealogical Center on, on, um, We're on right. Right. We're right. Boston, where you can get a lot of material there. There's a lot of it, the online research available through there is wonderful. And if you have old papers, if you have documents, I really highly recommend you get them over to them um, because your family may not value them, but the Jewish community uh, and the historians will. So it's the Weiner Center for Jewish Culture um, at 101. Newbury Street. Newbury Street, thank you. <laughs> I'll just chime in uh, to give a little bit more of a update about Randolph. Um, in the 80s, I was the education director at Temple Beth Am in Randolph. Um, there were only 300 kids in the religious school and they used to tell me about the old, good old days when there were 600. Um, when, you know, cause people did move do directly from Dorchester to Randolph and Stoughton and Canton and stuff. Um, and again, you know, sort of uh, in the, I don't know, 2000s or something, that's when all those shows sort of shrunk a little and um, just recently in the last five years I think it was the Temple Beth Am closed um, and it's been sold to a church and it has those gigantic Ten Commandments it's right on Main Street um, so it's been taken over by a church so it's the same kind of progression um, but at a much later 20 years 30 years later um, you know went from a community that was a very thriving uh, middle class to to nothing where did they move from Randolph? They didn't move to Randolph from Randolph. They were go going to combine with the Canton Shoal and the Stoughton Shoal. Well, and where did the people move? <laughs> um, a lot of them just, you know, uh, I think they down. retired. Uh, a lot of them, you know, um, I, I don't really know where the migration went. Uh, 
So Florida. Anybody uh yeah, Florida. <laughs> a, number, a number of them have moved to Nantasket, believe yeah. it or not. A number right. have moved to Nantasket and Yeah, and, and, and somebody people. Marty just wrote the same thing happened with Temple Beth and Moon and Brockton, but that happened a little earlier. That happened about ten years before Randolph fell apart. So uh yeah, there's a lot of changes going on. So anyway, uh any other questions, comments? Okay, well, thank you again, Phil. Thank you for all your memories, sure. people. And uh, we will, we are recording this. So if we, I can send out the recording if people are interested in a few days. And um, it was wonderful to come together and share and reminisce and learn a lot from a totally different perspective than I've heard this described in the past. So. Great job. Good night, thank all. You. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Bye, Lato. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Bye, Lato.